here today. It's quite an honor. And, you know, these are topics that are near and dear to my heart, uh, you know, as, as well as many teammates of mine and just uh, friends and colleagues that I have, have developed over the years in the sport that we all love. So I'm going to share my screen real quick and we will get started. So today we're going to talk about some pretty hard topics and that is navigating the topics of gymnast nutrition, weight, and body image as a coach or parent. Uh, if we have any gymnasts listening, you're more than welcome. Um, a lot of the advice today, you know, it's you guys live this experience. And so I think it's really important that um, we all recognize, you know, what is appropriate and what's not in terms of how we approach these topics, how we discuss them, um, and, and what changes need to be made moving forward. So as she said, you guys all know me. Um, but what, what she didn't share is that I'm also an eating disorder survivor. And so like many gymnasts, in my story, you know, it started how most of yours did. And I started gymnastics at an older age, I think 11 or 12. And there was no rhyme or reason to my eating, right? Like I, I was the good eater. My, my sister was the picky eater. So I was a little bit on the chubbier side because I loved food. And by not being picky and by cleaning my plate and finishing what my parents gave me, that was a way to get validation and to have some, some success. And so I wasn't very talented in the gym, but my parents gave me about a year to decide if I was going to get serious or not. And they didn't talk about weight. They didn't talk about anything other than just the objective measures that you have to be strong enough to pull yourself up on the bar. You have to be flexible enough to get your splits down. Like these are a requirement for you to be on team. And so I worked my tail off and I got my splits and I got my skills and I got stronger and I loved gymnastics. And I didn't think twice about, you know, weight. I was a little conscious of my body, like most, you know, preteen girls are, um, but it really didn't get in the way too much of, of what I ate or, or how I enjoyed gymnastics. As I got more serious about gymnastics, um, you know, the, the hours increased, the training increased, the frequency increased, and probably the summer before eighth grade, I grew several inches and, and slimmed down. And I didn't do anything to my eating. Um, I just continued to eat how I did. Um, I maybe ate something before practice. I certainly didn't take anything during practice except for water. Um, it wasn't something that our gym promoted. I mean, you were allowed to bring a snack, but it wasn't something that really was encouraged or enforced. One day during warmups, my coach pulled me aside and said, you know, hey, you're looking skinnier. What are you doing? And unbeknownst to him, that was the first positive comment about my weight that I had ever received in my life. And, and at that moment, I was like, man, I don't ever want to lose that. Like, I want to continue hearing those comments because I was always the chubby kid, right? I was always the kid that I was in bigger clothes than what my age said I should for the size. Um, I was conscious of my body. And so at that moment, um, he didn't mean it maliciously. He, he really was just coming from a place of concern. But as we'll talk about a little bit later, um, there are several reasons why making comments about weight in either direction can be very harmful. And so unfortunately, I, you know, was somewhat talented. I started jumping the levels quickly. I started experiencing a lot of overuse injuries from just too much too soon with inadequate um, programming and strength and conditioning. And with that, and with each injury, I started to get concerned about my weight and my body. And some of that was, you know, being a 14 year old gymnast. Other parts of that was the, you know, the things you hear, right? Like, let's think about the fluff that is aired when the Olympics are on or national competitions are on. Commentators love to talk about gymnast bodies and how, you know, they had this major injury and then they had this comeback, but they gained all this weight and it's a struggle. Like people love to glamorize these struggles. And oftentimes what we say, we don't know how much young girls are listening. And so I started to restrict my food. I started to weigh myself. I didn't think too much of it. Um, but then one summer, probably about when I was 16 and I was about to get my license, um, my body just continued to grow. I had gone through puberty, but it was just continuing to grow. And one day we're on balance beam and my coach is talking about all of our bodies, which is obviously highly inappropriate, but he's saying, you know, oh, look at her, her, you know, quote, breast and hips are developing. Obviously he used other language. And so I just remember listening to him talk about, you know, several of my teammates. And at that moment I swore I would never get bigger. I was, I was not going to grow. I was not going to develop anymore because I didn't want to be, you know, spotlighted in front of my teammates. I mean, that's just horrifically embarrassing for a 14, 15, 16 year old gymnast. 
So probably a couple weeks later, after we came back from a family vacation over 4th of July, I decided that I needed to slim down. Um, so around the time of the Olympics, you know, I had started looking at other gymnasts and in my adolescent mind, I had decided if I looked like them, my gymnastics would be like them without any respect to genetics and body diversity. I didn't know about that. So I asked my coach what I should do. I said, hey, you know, I feel like I need to slim down. And he said, oh, you know, just eat fruit for dinner. So here we are, the first, you know, misstep, right? Misguided advice to a 16 year old gymnast. And so of course I go home and, um, you know, every family has their struggles and it was easy for me to just, um, you know, come home late. My family had already eaten dinner. My sister had gone off to college. And so, you know, I told my dad who loved gymnastics just as much as me that, you know, this is what coach said and this is just what I need to do. And it's part of training. And so they let it slip by. And unfortunately that was the start to a perilous fight with an eating disorder, uh, anorexic tendencies that then, um, led me to the point of, you know, almost being pulled out of gymnastics. And I decided to eat enough to get by. Um, my parents took me to the pediatrician. Pediatrician gives them the, the typical spiel of, you know, eating disorders are a slippery slope. Here's a referral to the local eating disorder treatment center to see a therapist and a dietitian. At this point, I was in denial. Um, I wasn't going to admit I had disordered eating or an eating disorder, especially in our sport where a lot of these behaviors are so normalized. My parents were in denial because these behaviors are irrational uh, and difficult to understand. It's very difficult to understand why someone just won't eat. And so I had a couple of visits with the dietitian, had a couple of visits with the therapist, um, and my 16-year-old mind decided that you know I didn't like them because I didn't think that they knew what they were doing. So I just told my parents, um, I'm, I'm not going back. And I love my parents to death. They're wonderful and fabulous. Uh, but at that moment, they should have put their foot down and, and realized that, yes, I was 16 and I was your typical, you know, type A perfectionist, very mature gymnast with a lot of trust and a lot of independence. But, you know, eating disorders are rooted in lies and manipulation um, because it's all just a protective mechanism. So unfortunately, I, I went through the rest of my, you know, gymnastics career. I ended up having to retire halfway through senior year due to injuries that weren't healing from underfueling. Um, I then went off to college to study nutrition and, and really my motives were wrong. I, I just wanted to learn more about how to lose weight because I, I gained some weight back uh, and I didn't like it. I wasn't eating enough. And now we had swung to the other extreme of some overeating and binging tendencies from just still being so restricted and underfueled. So the next couple of years are really just characterized by me trying to figure out my nutrition philosophies, trying to sort through the nutrition noise and all the, you know, books and diets and the nutrition zealots that love to demonize this food and that food and, you know, almost give food a magical power to it. And it wasn't until mid-college where I, um, you know, signed myself up for counseling and, and realized that I didn't want to keep struggling with food in my body. Um, and it took years, years of counseling and thousands of dollars to, to really heal and recover um, from, from this struggle that is not unique to me, right? I, I'm just representative of hundreds, if not thousands of gymnasts that have that come before me and that come after me that have struggled and haven't had appropriate treatment. And there was just several steps along the way with comments and things that were allowed to go on that really could have been dealt with at several points and, you know, more um, you know, had expedited recovery and treatment. So with that, I'm delighted to talk to you today about how we can, you know, start changing the culture and how we do handle these sensitive issues because they come up. And I'm not going to sit here and just say, you need to ignore them. You need to put your head in the sand. Um, gymnasts are going to say things to you. Parents are going to say things to you. Coaches are going to say things. Medical providers, you know, people um, sometimes are concerned or have questions. And a lot of times at this point, especially, you know, after everything that's gone on in the last several years, um, people don't know what to say and they don't know how to handle it. So I want to jump in and tackle. So today we're going to talk about the history of the gymnast body. We're going to talk about eating disorders and gymnastics. We're going to talk about normal growth and development, what it is and what it's not, and what can we can expect. We'll talk about when things go wrong, and I'll give you a couple case studies and an algorithm that you can use as parents and coaches to help, you know, troubleshoot and decide what's next when you realize that something's wrong. And then how to help without harming, because this is really the key. So why should we be concerned with how we approach nutrition and weight? 
obviously you heard my story and it's like many of yours and we have to prevent disordered eating behaviors, negative body image and chronic suffering in life beyond the sport. I tell all of the clients I work with that as much as you love gymnastics, it is temporary, right? It's a gift, but it's here today and it can be gone tomorrow. And if you don't know how to nourish yourself and if you don't know how to take care of yourself, you will just struggle and struggle and struggle the day that you have to say goodbye to the gym, whether that's of your choice and you come to the end of your career or if it gets taken away from you early for a variety of reasons. So let's talk about the evolution of the gymnast body. So, you know, there are several things that stand out to us. If you look at the pictures along the bottom and it'll take you just through a brief timeline. Um, this first picture is from the 1964 Tokyo Olympics. And if you look at these gymnasts, they are young women, right? They have developed bodies. They have, you know, they're not as lean in terms of body composition because that's just not how gymnastics was back then. It didn't require um, the level of skill and strength that we see today. And so their bodies were just very representative of just a more normal kind of female body. They had breasts, they had hips, they had developed. And then we go to 19, you know, 76 with Nadia Comaneci, right? Perfect 10, youngest gymnast, 14 years old. And there's a huge contrast between these two bodies. Neither is good or bad, but unfortunately with that perfect 10, that started a whole new image of what the gymnast should look like and what was considered the gymnast body. Obviously through the next several decades, um, there are tales of eating disorders and inappropriate practices and abuse and things that are really just normalized. And then we get into the 2000s and we could look like, look at someone like Tasha Schweikert, an absolutely gorgeous, stunning, powerful gymnast, yet at the time was body shamed and was told that she should look like some of her teammates who were thinner and smaller, yet they were struggling to death with eating disorders. And that right there is just very, very, very wrong and messed up. Um, and that's partially why we're having this conversation today. Then we go on to the 2000, uh, 2008, you know, we have Nasty Luke and Sean Johnson, arguably two of the best gymnasts of their time, yet they have two very uh, contrastingly different body types. They each had their own strengths in and of themselves, yet at the same time, they didn't let their, their body style or their body type be a limitation to their performance. And then obviously in today's era, right, we've got the Jordan Weavers, the Madison Koshins, the Kyla Ross, we have obviously Simone Biles, arguably the best gymnast we've ever seen, that certainly defy that gymnast body type that we saw that really started in, in the 1970s. And some of the issues we have are really related to a larger cultural societal issue, and that is the societal standards of beauty and thinness. So we have a historical association that thin equals better, not only from a beauty perspective, but from a performance perspective, which is unfounded. Okay, so we'll talk about that a little bit later. And then the second aspect here is just the increase in the code of points difficulty. Um, obviously, you know, if we compare the 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s compared to the gymnastics of today, today's gymnastics requires such strength and power that you're going to have the musculoskeletal because of the training that has to be put forth in order to do the skills, right? Like there has to be a level of, of muscle and of strength to get yourself on the bars, to throw yourself in the air. Um, that's just going to come with what the code demands. And right, this is how gymnastics goes. The code comes out, we know the rules and we play by the rules. So when we move on to body diversity, we have to remember that there's no one gymnast body type. There are several factors that are responsible for an athlete's body type, and the first is genetics. So you don't get to choose what you look like, right? We don't get to choose our parents. Um, some are taller and leaner, some are shorter um, and, and broader. Your genetics are responsible for your genetic height potential, right? There's equations that we can use to determine um, how tall you'll be by the time you reach puberty based on your mom and your dad. Genetics are also responsible for what we call hormonal fat patterns. So as a female gymnast approaches puberty, um, estrogen signaling dictates where fat tissue is laid down in the body. This is one reason that, you know, some women have bigger breasts than others. Some women have more pronounced hips than others. Some women store more um, body fat in their abdomen versus their thighs. Again, no one gets to choose this. The second aspect is development, right? So everyone has a different timeline in terms of when they develop, when they get their period, when they you know, reach their height potential. Um, none of this is good or bad. It's just something we have to recognize is different. 
The third aspect is energy availability. And so, you know, unfortunately for a long time, there's been this thinner is better mentality in gymnastics, as well as an acceptance of poor growth, delayed puberty, stunting, which we all know are serious clinical issues with huge ramifications down the line in terms of, you know, bone density, fertility, yet we've accepted it. And so, you know, we know that, you know, being underdeveloped, having a delayed bone age, being underweight um, is not okay, nor is it beneficial to performance. And the last aspect of body diversity is training and nutrition, right? Those are the two modifiable factors, uh, arguably nutrition more than training, because gymnasts don't, they don't choose the, the training, they just participate. Um, but coaching and training methods can be effective in, in changing body composition along with nutrition. We're seeing that these days in the advent of, you know, external loading, right? Instead of just thousands and thousands of body weight reps, we're introducing strength training. Coaches are um, involving strength and conditioning coaches. I have several friends, you know, in the industry, whether it's, you know, Christina Myers or Dave Tilly that uh, are, you know, certified strength and conditioning coaches and are really challenging the cultural norms in our sports. And this has a profound impact on being able to change body composition along with appropriate fueling and nutrition. So in terms of the statistics, not to be the bearer of bad news, but we're not doing better. So general population, at least for females, we know that 41.5% of high school female athletes report disordered eating. In gymnasts, we have studies from the 2000s that show at least 50 to 60% of gymnasts have disordered eating symptoms or a true clinical eating disorder, and we'll talk about that more. Eating disorders have the highest mortality rate of all mental illnesses, and unfortunately, a lot of the behaviors that go on in gymnastics, whether they're subclinical eating disorders, disordered behaviors, body dysmorphia, um, they are related to eating disorders and have serious health consequences, uh, yet, yet they're normalized. In terms of consequences beyond sport, we know so many gymnasts have chronic issues with weight, with body image and nutrition that outlast their time in the sport, potentially their whole life, and, and we can do better. So why are gymnasts at risk, right? It's not all the coaches' fault. It's not all the parents' fault. Um, you know, obviously the first issue is, is inappropriate nutrition and weight practices. So this could be the result of an eating disorder or disordered eating or just unintentional underfueling or normalization of inappropriate behavior. So a lot of times it starts as simply as the young gymnast climbs the level. She's working out 20 plus hours a week. Practice schedules are off in terms of, you know, they're in the middle of meals and snacks, and uh, maybe it's just not promoted that they should bring snacks and really need to focus on their nutrition outside of training. So they end up just being in this chronic energy deficit, which then delays growth and puberty and causes all sorts of issues. The second aspect is obviously gymnasts themselves. So, you know, gymnastics attracts uh, often a certain type, right? It's that perfectionist uh, type A behavior. I'm, I'm a recovered, you know, type A myself. And, and this mentality is I must try harder, right? It's all in my control. Um, it doesn't count if it's not perfect. And so unfortunately, these personality types will take things like eat less sugar and in their minds, that translates to, I shouldn't eat any sugar. Um, I'll tell you that just this week, I have two different gymnasts that are struggling with food in their bodies. And these struggles stemmed from some health classes that they were required to take at school. And in these classes, there was just tons of information about nutrition um, that was not buffered with you know, age appropriate uh, sensitivity. And you know, statements like, you, know, you shouldn't eat saturated fat easily get turned into you can never have a hamburger, you shouldn't be eating red meat, um, and a lot of just exaggerated overgeneralizations that are not supported by the current literature. The last aspect is just, unfortunately, our sport has a poor history of proper nutrition education and support. And this is, you know, encompassing insufficient fueling practices, inadequate caloric intake, and then excessive exercise energy expenditure. So one great example of this is a lot of the high-level gymnasts I work with go to a four-hour practice with just a bottle of water. Yet you talk to any runner and they know that when they're running beyond 60, 90 minutes, they have a carbohydrate based electrolyte drink. They have additional supplemental carbohydrate. Um, you look at the cyclist, tons of articles about them, you know, consuming 60, 90, 120 grams of carbohydrate per hour to maximize workout output and performance. 
yet gymnastics as a sport has been one that, you know, I, th I think sometimes we're the exception to the rule, right? Like you don't need water or you don't need anything else, just water and, and you'll be fine. So what are our current issues? If I had to boil them down, it's number one, inappropriate nutritional advice from coaches, parents, and unqualified practitioners. I'm just going to call it like it is. And the second would be inappropriate body comments and body weight standards that are not based on objective data. We have to look at performance over aesthetic. So here's a quote from a really great paper that you all should read, and I'm happy to post um, the reference, but it says the vast majority of athletes feel like they're on a constant chronic diet. It's typical for athletes to spend hours of daily training with only water and no other snack and coaches are aware of this. So it, this is a normalized behavior that is inappropriate. So this brings us to relative energy deficiency in sport. So again, when we talk about under fueling and inadequate nutrition, red S stems from a chronic energy deficit. So this is either inadequate caloric intake and or excessive energy expenditure. Very common in our gymnasts who are practicing four, five, six hours a day, training runs into meals, and the culture just doesn't support fueling for performance. Red S is going to alter many physiological systems. It affects the hormones, menstrual function, your metabolism, bone mineralization. It affects psychological health as well as protein synthesis, which lends to you know, muscular training, adaptation, recovery. Red S may or may not be uh, characterized with disordered eating. So it could be the result of an eating disorder or disordered eating practices, or it could just be accidental, um, unintentional underfueling, which again, often goes back to normalization of inappropriate behaviors. So then we get to the more serious topic of, you know, disordered eating versus true clinical eating disorders. So, you know, the two big ones are anorexia nervosa, that's the restrictive disorder, refusal to maintain an appropriate body weight, intense fear of gaining weight or being fat, refusal to eat enough to support life and to support training. Uh, bulimia nervosa is, you know, eating a lot, binging, and then purging as a means to try to get rid of, of those calories. And there are many Olympic gymnasts that, um, has come forth and, and said that they have struggled with, with either of these disorders um, that went on for many years in their careers, may have been even encouraged, um, but they were just trying to do whatever they could to get their weight down. And then there's a category of eating disorders called the other specified feeding or eating disorders. And this includes, you know, binge eating disorder, atypical anorexia, night eating syndrome, and then there's a category called the avoidant restrictive food intake disorder, which includes orthorexia. So orthorexia is a term we throw around that isn't a true like diagnosis, um, but it characterized that it's that perfect eating, right? It's the clean eating, it's the refusal to eat anything that is not pure, that is you know, processed, that doesn't come from the ground. And unfortunately those behaviors are often glorified um, and, and for young gymnasts can quickly turn into um, inadequate energy intake, weight loss, red S, so on and so forth. So unfortunately, eating issues also attract mental health issues or, you know, chicken or the egg in this situation. We see high rates of anxiety and depression found in individuals that are struggling with food, whether it's over or under eating. We have to help our athletes develop more tools for coping. You know, part of my own story was I learned to cope with food. Um, I was, you know, a very smart kid, a little socially awkward, tended to isolate myself in practice because I was just so intense and focused and felt like I couldn't have fun and I couldn't goof off. And so because of that, food was just a way for me to, to fill the void in my life that just really needed more pleasure and relaxation and fun. Um, a lot of athletes I work with struggle with emotional eating, and this could be restrictive eating. So, you know, the absence of eating and effort to feel hunger and to feel like they're in control or the overeating and binge tendencies, which often feed off each other. And then the last part would be that rigid eating, right? That refusal to eat anything that's unclean or, you know, imperfect. And the reason this is such a problem and we have to pay attention to the language we use around food is that young athletes engage in a lot of dichotomous thinking. That's the black and white, the all or nothing thinking. And so, you know, when you as a coach or parent say something to them about food, they're very likely to take it to the extreme. I already gave you two examples before, you know, eat less junk food or eat less sugar easily translates into, I can never have this ever again. Uh, or my coach will think I'm bad or I'm fat or whatever. 
So how are we talking about food? And I, I want you to know that I come, I come at this from a place of just the utmost empathy, but also very strong conviction um, after struggling for you know eight plus years with an eating disorder um, that was really fed from a lot of the misinformation um, that is spread online and by parents and coaches. So <clears throat> I want you to watch your language. When we say good and bad foods, that sets your athlete up for failure. And the truth is restriction doesn't work. It is human nature to want what we don't have. So the moment you tell your gymnast not to have sugar, that's all they're gonna be able to think about. Um, one of the pivotal moments in my own story, it was right before Thanksgiving, <clears throat> which of course, you know, after Halloween and Thanksgiving, Christmas, everyone's talking about, you know, the holiday food and dieting and weight gain. And I remember my coach came into the gym one day and said, all right, we all need to stop eating sugar and we're gonna do it for like two weeks. And at that point, this is prior to the eating disorder. And at some point I had heard from a nurse or an athletic trainer that chocolate milk was a really good recovery beverage after practice because it had carbs and it had protein. So at the time I had my little, you know, Tetra packs of chocolate milk that I would drink on the way home and I enjoyed it. But at that moment, when my coach said to all of us on team, you know, we're, we're going to stop sugar, it made me question this advice I had received. And I determined at that moment, like this was bad, that sugar was toxic. I stopped drinking the chocolate milk. I stopped eating a lot of desserts. And that just set me up for years and years and years of struggling with food. The second term that I'm probably gonna step on some toes with is clean eating. And this term is arbitrary and it doesn't guarantee performance. So the thing with clean eating or that pursuit of, you know, it can't have added sugar, salt, or fat. It has to be wholesome. You know, it's gotta be the broccoli and the chicken and it can't be processed or packaged. Um, you know, a lot of people use that as a method for weight control. Um, you may eat less while eating clean just because there's not, you know, some added fat or sugar that adds calories. But at the end of the day, when we're talking about body composition, when we're talking about weight, calories count. And for some reason, especially in the gymnastics world, <clears throat> we take this clean eating or even, you know, create a culture of clean eating and we almost give food magical powers. And so a lot of the gymnasts I work with are terrified of carbs, terrified of sugar. In their minds, they think that certain foods are literally going to be sewn on their body like fat if they eat them. And that's just a fundamental misunderstanding in the laws of thermodynamics, physiology and metabolism, but unfortunately is a very widespread um, cultural sentiment. My advice is to use evidence-based nutrition guidelines that are aged and developmentally appropriate. Clean is easily taken as good or bad. What I'm not saying is that we shouldn't be focusing on nutritious, wholesome foods, what we call nutrient density or foods that have a high amount of vitamins and minerals and antioxidants. Yes, we need those. The diet needs to be 80 or 90% of those in order for these high level athletes to get what they need for their bodies to repair and recover. But 80 or 90% quote clean or good or perfect is different than 100%. And it's that 10 or 20% of fun foods or eating what you enjoy and what you love that really creates a sustainable diet. Lastly, you have to teach your athletes to both fuel to perform and to nourish their bodies. And we have to remember that food is fuel, but it's also social, it's cultural, and it's emotional. And so when your gymnast goes to the, bar the birthday party, you enjoy cake at a birthday party because that's part of the shared experience. It's the part of being present. And there's no reason that that piece of cake cannot fit into their daily you know, dietary pattern. To say that they should avoid all sweets or all foods or all whatever, um, it's just unrealistic and it's going to set them up for uh, very likely overeating and just struggling with food as well as a lot of guilt and anxiety and shame. So when we look at both female and male athletes, we have to understand growth and development. So I'm going to take you through females, males. We're going to talk about, you know, what you should be looking for and if this is something to be concerned about or not. So the preteen gymnast nine to 12, they're going to gain five to seven pounds a year. They should be gaining weight. This is normal. If you look at a growth chart, the curve trends up until they're past puberty, about 16, 17, 18 years old. At this time, we may see some breast hip development. Um, we're going to see extra abdominal fat. That is all part of the body preparing for puberty. So for those of you whose gymnasts have come out of COVID and they're in this age range, they haven't started their period yet, and all of a sudden they have a little bit of a belly on them, 
it's not because they were reckless with their diet or didn't try hard enough or whatever. This is just their body preparing to do what it knows to do. Um, and it's going to all redistribute and their body will settle, settle out as it should. In terms of height, they're going to gain about two and a half inches a year. Then we move on to teens, so 13 to 17. Average weight gain is 21 pounds during adolescence, and growth will continue until they, uh, they reach their adult height, which is about after puberty, and this could be 3.3 3 to 3.5 3 inches a year. They're going to have more curves, right, so more hip development, the hip, hips widen, their body composition is going to shift, so that extra abdominal fat is going to redistribute into the breast and the hips, this is normal. This is healthy. This is a young girl turning into a young woman, and it happens to all of us. Obviously, as a young adult, in the gymnastics world, we may have some delayed growth, and that, that's not something to be celebrated. That's not a badge of honor. So some gymnasts may not be finished growing um, at, teen, at 18. But the thing to remember, and what I tell my athletes, is your 18-year-old body should not look like your pre-pubertal 10 to 12-year-old body. And unfortunately, at one point, this was celebrated in gymnastics, right? Girls were um, praised if their bodies were smaller and they weren't getting their periods and they had delayed growth um, because we had this, this image of, you know, thinner is better, thinner girls fly higher, um, which is just wrong and, and not backed by science. Obviously my branding and my platform is, is very female focused, um, but I can't leave the males out of this because they struggle just as much as our females and arguably have way less support. So their growth pattern is a little bit different. They generally hit puberty later. From nine to 12 years old, they'll gain about five to nine pounds a year, average two and a half inches per year. Growth spurt depends on puberty. As a teen, they can gain up to 34 pounds or even more. During those adolescent years, they continue to grow. And as a young adult, and this is something very common in the men's world, uh, they may still continue to gain weight and height, especially musculoskeletal related to testosterone and purity. But oftentimes we see delayed growth due to inadequate energy intake. So um, males are not, um, they're not limited here uh, to, to, to being free of these struggles. I'll tell you all the time, I have male gymnasts contact me on my platforms and say, you know, thank you so much for what you're promoting and your messaging. And that right there is enough to stop you in your tracks because typically food and body issues has always been uh, characterized as a female struggle. And that's just not the case. So we have to talk a little bit about body image. So, you know, as a coach or as a parent, I'm gonna ask you to question your own beliefs about the ideal gymnast body and recognize that you may yourself have some personal struggles. The reality is that many coaches and parents struggle themselves and, and can often project these struggles onto their athletes. Um, we all struggle, right? No one is perfect, but it's very important that you address your own struggles because your kids are watching everything you do. Um, I, I saw a great thing on Twitter the other day and it was a nurse that was saying how she was in the bathroom weighing herself and her five-year-old daughter walks in the bathroom and says, oh, mommy, are you stepping on the thing that tells you how beautiful you are? And this was as the mom was stepping on the scale. So your children, your athletes are watching every single thing you do from what you eat to how you talk about food to how you talk about your body. They're very impressionable and they need healthy role models in their lives. Self-esteem informs body image. So when we look at the gymnast who has a lot of skills which, and, and talents which should translate into higher self-esteem, yet we know that oftentimes they don't have high self-esteem and why? Well, a lot of this is just the myth surrounding the perfect body. Um, you know, things that coaches say to them that, you know, you know things like, um, you know, tone it down a little bit with the food or, you know, lay off the desserts a little bit. Like all of these statements are code for uh, your fat. I don't think you're um, thin enough. You know, maybe the gymnast doesn't fit the team's ideal, um, which is ridiculous because everyone has a different body type. And there are plenty of ways that gymnastics routines can be comprised in order to, you know, score and to do well. The last part of body image is, you know, negative body image and assumptions related to that and then body dysmorphia. So a lot of gymnasts will assume that their appearance is equal to success, worth, and value, right? So if I only looked better, if I was only prettier, if I only had more muscles, if I was only leaner, then my gymnastics would be better. Then I would be more well-loved. Then I would have more attention paid to me. They also believe that by managing physical appearance, they can control social and emotional life. So a lot of gymnasts 
um, you know, they have everything regimented for them, right? They're told where to be, when to be, what to do. Um, they have very little say over their training schedules and their life. And so in effort to kind of gain back some control, often food in their body is an area that they latch on to. So when we're looking at our gymnasts and, you know, they're coming back from the COVID break or they're just, you know, growing and developing, how do we know if their body change is representative of excessive weight gain or normal growth? And I'm going to just put this out here because I know you all wonder it and you talk amongst yourselves, yet some of you know enough that you, you feel like you just can't broach the subject. So number one is we have to check with the pediatrician. We have to look at growth chart history. So when you look at a growth chart, there are percentiles and these go from you know the fifth percentile to the 95th percentile and are just representative of thousands of children's of data that we have compiled. So obviously the top percentile would be the tallest or the heaviest for age. The bottom would be the shortest or the lightest for age. In terms of what we consider normal growth, it's a child tracking along their own curve. So, you know, maybe your gymnast weight is around the 25th percentile, but they're healthy and they're growing. That could be normal for them. On the contrary, maybe their weight is at the 75th or the 85th percentile. That could be very healthy and normal for them. And we want to see them continuing along that percentile. When we see growth level off, and it, it stops following that curve, that is when we have problems, whether it's intentional underfueling that's now causing you know, red S and delayed growth, or whether it's an intentional eating disorder um, based on comments that have been said or just you know, ideas that the gymnast has read about and, and implemented. So the second thing you have to recognize, especially if you're worried about excessive weight gain, is it's rarely the food. And so this goes back to just mental health challenges and you know, young athletes using food to cope. When I talk with clients, I tell them there are four things that people cope with, drugs, sex, alcohol, and food. And under 18, food is the most readily available and arguably legal substance to use to cope. So unfortunately, our gymnasts are not excluded here. There are a lot that at a young age, you know, even between five and eight years old, learn to cope with food. And so, you know, when you see a gymnast and you're worried about their growth or you feel like they've gained too much weight, um, it, it's very unlikely that it's for lack of education. We could have much deeper issues going on. The third point is no body talk. So body shaming never works. Um, I want you to think about your own life. Um, if you're married or you have a partner uh, or just, you know, your, your family, telling people they've gained weight, they're eating too much, they're fat, they need to lose weight. Um, none of this ever works, right? If, if you have a partner or you're married, you know that it doesn't matter what you say, a person has to internalize the desire and the motivation to change. And so telling your athlete that they're fat, telling them that they gained too much weight um, is not going to solve the problem and is more than likely going to trigger disordered behavior. So the biggest thing is you need to learn to listen. And we'll talk a little bit more about that. Comments about weight loss are also harmful. So unfortunately, this is something that we celebrate as a society, but we should not. And there's four reasons why. Number one, you have no idea how that person lost the weight. So, you know, if a gymnast comes in and all of a sudden they're leaner and they're thinner, praising the weight loss achieved through harmful methods, it's just going to reinforce those methods. So it doesn't matter what they tell you. They're probably going to tell you what you want to hear. But very likely for teenage gymnasts, they are crash dieting, they're using diuretics, they're using laxatives, they are engaging in risky behaviors, which is just part of adolescent development. Um, they, they don't have the cognition to do, quote, healthy weight loss techniques um, on their own. Second aspect is that weight regain is very probable. So if you praise someone for their weight loss, whether it's related to an eating disorder or not, there's a 95 to 97% chance they're going to gain all that weight back plus some. So how are they gonna feel then, right? We, we've all done it before, right? We've, we've been thinner, we've lost weight. People say how great we look and then we gain it back. And then it's like, oh, so you actually thought I was fat. Like you think I'm better when I'm smaller. Like that is very damaging uh, to self-esteem and to the gymnast view of themselves. The third thing is comments about other gymnasts weight loss or them being thinner or looking better what does this say about other people who live in larger bodies? And this is just part of body diversity. So when you praise a gymnast for their weight loss, other gymnasts are hearing this and they think to themselves, oh gosh, I'm fat, coach doesn't like me, I'm not good enough. And that in and of itself can just start a downward spiral of disordered thoughts and behaviors. So what should you say instead? 
things like you seem strong, good effort, great attitude, I'm happy to see you. These are comments that you can use instead of praising weight loss. And arguably for the teen gymnast, if you are noticing weight loss, that is a red flag that you need to question and not assume that they just started to eat better or you know it's something that's healthy. Oftentimes uh, it's, it's methods that are inappropriate and are not um, helpful for them. Because the reality is teenage, preteen gymnasts should continue to grow. So how do you support your athlete through body change? Number one, we normalize the change. So everyone grows up. We should avoid chastising them based on them being a heavy spot, right? We've all heard that sometimes of, you know, coaches griping about having to spot the gymnast. Um, when I was a gymnast in my last two years of gymnastics, you know, we had the older girls group and the younger girls group. And it was very clear that one of my coaches uh, who really just wasn't strong enough to spot us older girls, he just didn't. He just didn't pay attention, right? He paid attention to the younger girls group who were all pre-pubertal, um, easy to throw around and spot and catch. Um, and that's just not, that's just not right. Like, you know, let's look at our staff. Let's make sure that we have people who can support these growing and developing athletes. Second thing would be, you know, avoid complaining about the equipment. So even though you're maybe just uh, saying things in jest, you know, about having to move the equipment up and down or different settings, it's very easy for a gymnast to hear that and think, gosh, I'm, I'm fat. Like coach doesn't think I'm worth anything. You know, they're, I'm the problem that they're having to move the equipment. And absolutely positively do not talk about developing breasts, hips, or et cetera. Um, you know, male coaches, you have to be particular careful with this you know dads uh, you, you like to joke and, and I get that but your words have so much power to them and to the teenage gymnast you know when they hear things like that it's it's not funny and so best practice is we, we don't have any body talk it's it's not purposeful it's not productive um, and it really can only cause harmful things what you can do is focus on performance, right these are not little bodybuilders you know bodybuilders get shredded down to super physical physiological levels of leanness but the function is not there right they have low libido they are exhausted they're fatigued they're obsessed with food like they're not healthy and they certainly could not perform like a gymnast needs to and so that's why we focus on performance over aesthetic so focusing on speed on stamina on strength on skills flexibility sleep and recovery and this might mean that you need to get more training for yourself you know as you have girls that are getting older and have gone through puberty and their strength to weight ratio changes, you may need to employ different tactics, different strength and conditioning programming in order to help them. Right now, this is very evident with the COVID comeback. Um, I have a lot of older gymnasts that, you know, over the break continue to go through puberty. Uh, their bodies are taller, they're different, they're heavier, and they're having a hard time and they're not progressing as fast as their younger pre-pubertal teammates. And, you know, we have to stop and recognize like we're in it for the long game. And a lot of these high level gymnast goals is collegiate gymnastics, because uh, obviously a very small portion make it to elite. And so when we look at the vast majority of collegiate athletes, these are young men and young women. They're not little girls and little boys. And so embrace the change, embrace the growth. It may take you a year to figure out how to work with this new body that's taller and heavier, but play to their strengths and keep it very positive. The lastly would be refer out. So if you have an athlete that's really struggling with their body and with change, you need to very quickly involve nutrition, a pediatrician, therapist, sports psych, and we'll talk about really specifically what you should do in a second. The key thing here is it's really important to regularly involve these professionals in the gym because then when issues come up, whether it's nutrition, fear, anxiety, you have a relationship with these professionals and your athletes. And so it helps take away some of the stigma. Um, I'll tell you part of my own story, you know, in terms of my parents taking me to the eating disorder dietitian and the therapist at 16. Um, you know, I was diagnosed with an eating disorder, but I wasn't about to announce that. I, I wasn't going to own it. I wasn't going to accept it because there's so much stigma around those terms even today. And so one thing by regularly involving these professionals, it makes it a lot easier to involve the parents in a conversation when issues come up. Because again, there's a lot of stigma, stigma with, oh, that gymnast was referred to the dietitian. You know what that means. Coach thinks she's fat, whether or not that's actually the case. 
So should weight be used as an indicator of performance? So weight versus body composition. Weight on the scale is just a combination of muscle bone fluid, intestinal contents, hormonal fluid shifts. Body composition is more specific and looks at fat mass versus fat-free mass, which includes muscle bone and fluid. The thing is, we know that athletes are growing and changing. They're not like a 20 something professional athlete who we can measure body composition, employ different interventions and measure the results. We also know that underfueled athletes often have a higher body fat percentage because of decreases in their metabolic rate, increases in energy storage and increased muscle breakdown, which not only is not ideal for body composition and leanness, but also is not ideal for adaptation to the training, which is the goal. So should we be measuring body composition in these young athletes? My first question to you, whether it's an elite gymnast, a high level JO gymnast, even a collegiate gymnast would be, why do you need this information? Is there a body fat percentage, which for every tool out there that could be used has a, as a margin of error, why do you need this information? Is it, in, is it going to change your plan? More than likely, the information is not appropriate for you. It's not within your scope of practice. And secondly, body composition measuring is really not appropriate unless these are national and collegiate level athletes with advanced nutrition skills. There are so many factors that influence body composition that we could address, nutrition, sleep, stress management, appropriate rest and training that will have a profound impact on their body composition before we just do a bunch of testing, tell them what their body fat percentage is and then put them on a diet. For these athletes, so certainly any in the JO program, and I would argue even our elite track and, and young college athletes, there should be a limited focus and discussion on body composition. And it may be measured in terms of, you know, coming from a health perspective, you know, a DEXA scan is one method to measure body composition as well as bone density. So arguably for an athlete, we're suspecting red S, you know, we want to check the bone mineralization um, because we know they're at risk for stress fractures. But other than that, you know, th there's a reason that, that a lot of this equipment is limited to research-based settings um, or, or very elite, you know, sports performance centers. So another quote I want to bring in from um, one of these papers about, you know, disordered eating from, you know, gymnasts and coach and judge perspectives is that, you know, the coach has such an influential role in the gymnast's life. Comments from someone critically important to them um, to, it, to the athlete, you know, it carries so much weight. Telling a gymnast she's too fat or praising her for losing excess weight without knowing the means by which she has lost the weight can easily initiate or solidify an overeating disorder. So whether you're praising or chastising, whether they've gained weight or lost weight, your words matter and they mean more to the gymnast than their own parents oftentimes. Can or should a gymnast lose weight? This is always the question in the room and one that I'm always happy to discuss you know, on a case by case basis. So the number one thing is we have to look at weight versus body composition. We have to respect the gymnast genetics and we have to recognize that the scale weight is not equal to body composition, which is not equal to performance. Second thing I wanna introduce is what I call the law of diminishing returns. So just lose five pounds is a very common sentiment in gymnastics that unfortunately can easily spiral into an eating disorder, cause low energy availability and impair training adaptation. So, you know, at, at what cost, you know, objectively, would the gymnast perform better if they were five or 10 pounds lighter? I don't know, maybe, potentially, you really don't have objective data to give a concrete answer to that. But I can say that more than likely the process of losing five or 10 pounds for the growing adolescent gymnast is likely to cause more harm than good. The third aspect is the young gymnasts are still growing and changing. The body is going to fight weight loss because it wants to continue to grow and develop. Focus on healthy behaviors and allow the body to settle, right? Ideal body weight at this age is a moving target. And more importantly, if your gymnast is struggling on either end of the spectrum, we have to look deeper and recognize that addressing anxiety and disordered eating patterns are likely going to have a more profound impact on their health and their overall body composition for the better. So in the coach role with nutrition, it is to provide qualified evidence-based nutrition education. And I highly recommend bringing in a professional to the entire team, which really helps to take away that stigma or singling out. They're to focus on performance and strength, and you need to stay connected to the parent regarding health and performance and you know, if anything's going wrong. What's not the coach's role is providing nutrition counseling or reviewing food records or requesting food journals or weighing gymnasts. Um, I thought that these were outdated practices, uh, but they are not. They are still things that are occurring and they are highly, highly inappropriate. 
Second thing is making comments about gymnast weight or appearance. So lining the team up and giving a fat talk, singling out a gymnast and you know chastising her about her body is very inappropriate. It's not productive and it's more than likely just going to spur further disordered behaviors that probably are already go going on. The last thing is, you know, making comments about a gymnast's weight or nutrition and saying that that is directly causing their injuries or, you know, detriment to their performance is, again, unfounded. It's not evidence-based. It's not an objective fact, and it is very, very harmful. There's a lot of things I hear coaches and parents saying about, you know, oh, if you didn't eat that before the meet, you wouldn't have fallen off the beam four times. Okay, food is not magical, right? There's no direct correlation of if I ate this, this will happen to my performance. Like we have to look at the food of, okay, you had French fries before practice. That's a carbohydrate that's high in fat. The fat's gonna delay how quickly the carbohydrates are able to get into the bloodstream and reach the muscles in the brain. So if you were sluggish in the beginning of practice, it wasn't because you had French fries, which are a bad food. It's because we didn't provide the body what it needed. It wasn't the appropriate food at the right time. So in terms of parents, you know, in the sport of women's gymnastics where the most elite gymnasts are under 19 and they're living in the family whole home, the role of the parents is crucial. And the thing I see with gymnasts is they're very independent. They have a lot of trust. Some of them have a lot of maturity because that's one of the beautiful aspects of the sport and just the work ethic that it creates. But unfortunately, that allows a lot of parents to be a little hands off, including my own. And I wish I could go back 10 plus years ago. And I wish my parents had made me see that eating disorder therapist and the dietitian, or maybe we even could have gotten a second opinion. Um, it would have saved me eight plus years of struggling, thousands of dollars that I had to pay out of my own pocket for treatment. Um, and, and I needed them to be the parent, even though I was 16 and I was very responsible and very trustworthy. Um, the nature of the beast is that, you know, eating disorders are, are illnesses and, and they need to be treated appropriately. So parents, your role is huge, right? You set the tone. Something called the division of responsibilities from a really famous dietitian named Ellen Satter. And this in a nutshell is parents provide the what of the food, so a healthy balance of nourishing foods with regularly scheduled meals and snacks, and the child chooses how much, and this really fosters them being able to listen to their own bodies and learn to self-regulate. Parents need to encourage appropriate performance nutrition. If your gymnast refuses to eat food before a four plus hour practice, they should not be going to practice. In no other sport would we consider it appropriate to not have some sort of fuel before and during a practice of that intensity and duration. Parents also need to enforce medical team recommendations, whether it comes to nutrition, eating disorder treatment, uh, return to play plans with injuries. They need to keep in communication with the coaches and they need to be a listening ear. Oftentimes your athlete just needs you to listen and you can learn a lot if you can just sit there and be quiet. The parent's role is not to make body comments, whether they're positive or negative. It is not to make the gymnast special meals separate from the family, put them on a diet, unless they've been diagnosed with a food allergy or something to warrant some sort of adjustment or restriction. And it's not to allow the gymnast to just do it themselves because they seem more mature. You have to parent. These are still little girls and I don't care, you know, little girls and little boys that Deep inside, they need you. They need mom and dad to stand up to them, to you know, stand up against them and to really help them learn to continue fueling and nourishing their bodies appropriately. So in this last part, how do we help without harming? Number one, as a coach or a parent, you evaluate. What is the real concern, whether it's about weight or body image, and can I reassure the child or teen? Start there. Number two, am I qualified? Is this a problem I am qualified to deal with? More than likely, it is not. If your gymnast is struggling with feeling fat, they're struggling with their weight, if you're watching them lose weight, um, oftentimes things like just eat or just cut back is unhelpful advice and there's so much more below the tip of the iceberg that you are not privy to at this point. Third step is to refer out. So if you're not qualified, who do you refer to? This is your team, right? So it starts with pediatric and adolescent sports med physicians. Their job is to evaluate growth and development, reproductive health, injuries, bone health, et cetera. Obviously most will have a physical therapist on board. They're familiar with gymnast movement training their personalities. Oftentimes it's the physical therapist who teams up with the doctor to put the brakes on when we're dealing with red S or overuse injuries and saying, hey, it is not safe for you to go back at this time or I think some underfueling is going on 
I, I think you need to go and be evaluated by, you know, another professional, AKA the sports dietitian nutritionist. So you want to work with someone who is trained in eating disorders and disordered eating, along with familiarity of pediatric and adolescent nutrition. Our young athletes are not just small adults. Their nutrition needs are different, their metabolism is different, and their development and behavior is very different. Fourth member is gonna be the orthopedist, right? Injuries happen, this is part of the sport, but they also can recognize signs of overuse, red S, and they can help the team develop the return to play plan. Fifth aspect would be the therapist or the sports psychologist. So our athletes are not, um, they're, they're not absolved from struggling with anxiety, depression, OCD, perfectionism, fear, et cetera. Um, therapy is what, what saved my life. Um, I love it. I would recommend it to anyone. Uh, no one is too good for therapy. No one is too broken for therapy. Um, I had fear issues that, you know, weren't addressed in gymnastics and had I had access to some of, you know, the really fabulous sports psych professionals we work with, you know, my, my career may have looked different. And the last part of this team would be strength and conditioning coaches or exercise physiologists. So involve them. Don't be so prideful that you think you know it all. Ask questions, be open to learning, uh, be open to, to questioning your own bias and, your, and adopting other people's viewpoints. These physical movement experts are going to help with appropriate programming, etc. especially for athletes who are struggling during puberty to adjust to these new bodies. So a couple case studies as we close. So what do you do if you have a gymnast who seems to quote, have put on weight? Number one, is this weight objectively affecting her performance or is this a training and programming issue? You have to be very honest with yourself here. The second part is she still could be under fueling. So she could be, you know, under fueling and then binging. She could be under fueling and that's why she's not getting as lean as you think she should be. First step is to talk to the parent in private. You do not single the gymnast out. You certainly don't talk to them in front of the team. I would start with the parent, voice your concerns and see what's going on. A second step would be to ask the athlete how they're feeling. A lot of the high level gymnasts I've worked with that were chastised about their weight starting when they were 13 to 14 years old, were performing the best they'd ever performed and felt the best they ever performed, felt the best they ever did at that time point. And so to have a coach come in and say, your body weight's too high, you need to lose weight, was just completely confusing and led to years and years of them struggling with food in their bodies. The next thing to ask is, is this just normal growth in puberty? So change happens, weight gain happens. Uh, right now with COVID, this is the longest break that most athletes have ever been out of the gym. So we're seeing a lot of normal catch up growth. And so what you may think is excessive weight gain could very well be normal growth and they may not have been in a good place prior to this point. Find out what else is going on. If it's really serious, which I would take any anything regarding weight or nutrition as a serious concern, refer to a dietitian nutritionist, possibly a therapist, take them to the pediatrician, look at the growth charts, um, really see what's going on and don't let this slide. The second would be the 16 year old gymnast struggling in the gym. She's got a lot of overuse injuries, maybe seems to be losing weight or just isn't growing. Um, this may or may not be related to an eating disorder. It could be red S, it could be unintentional underfueling coupled with excessive training. Again, talk to the parent in private, ask the athlete how they're feeling, how their view of performance is, then refer to a dietitian nutritionist, get them a medical evaluation with the appropriate physician, uh, probably need to be evaluated by the orthopedist or the physical therapist. They're probably already there with the injuries. And then they may need a therapist because, you know, may, maybe it's the athlete themselves and they're working out a ton at home, uh, unbeknownst to the coach. You know, it's, it's the anxiety, it's the, the drive. Um, and so maybe we need to put some restrictions there in order to keep them healthy and safe and allow them to develop. The last one would be, you know, the 17 year old gymnast with the active eating disorder. This is not something to be ignored. This again has the highest mortality rate of all mental illnesses and is not something uh, that you let slip by. And coaches and parents play a vital role in enforcing the treatment team's plan. So often with eating disorders, you know, we have a pediatrician, we have an eating disorder specialist, we have a dietitian, a therapist, orthopedist, the PT. Everyone has to work together and have the same message in, in order to beat this really, really deadly disease. Red S and eating disorders should be treated like injuries. So, you know, if your athlete has an eating disorder or if they have red S, they need to be pulled. They, there needs to be exercise restrictions. Uh, it, it needs to be viewed just like any other injury where there would be a very clear cut rehab and return to play plan in place. 
acknowledge that both mental and physical recovery needs need to happen for safe return to sport. So just because their rate re weight restored doesn't mean that they've done the mental work to put them in a better and safe, healthy place. Obviously refer to a dietitian. We need a medical evaluation. We need a therapist. I mean, this is something you don't want to mess with. And so having that team, you know, as a coach or a parent, being familiar with the experts in your, your area, you never know when you're going to need someone. And I guarantee you, most of these professionals will welcome a phone call from you to, 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 to talk, right? All the time I'll talk with a coach and, you know, they'll give me the, the brief details of a situation. And I'm very happy to help kind of outline, you know, what potentially the best next steps would be in terms of getting this athlete treatment. So in summary, we have to support healthy growth and development. We have to embrace body diversity and recognize that it's performance over aesthetic every single time. As parents and coaches, we have to model healthy behaviors and bring in professionals for education. So incorporate nutrition training into your programming along with mental health training. Like these are two aspects that are very important to the gymnast and shouldn't be overlooked um, and just left for those who are struggling. This is something that everyone needs that is beneficial to them as a gymnast, as a person into their career. Lastly, you need to know and to refer out. Recognize when you're out of your scope. Involve parents and professionals immediately. Uh, don't be swindled by the gymnast, you know, diminishing on the issues or the concerns. Do what's right, you know, follow your gut, ask questions, because ultimately you may be saving a life and doing what's best for this gymnast. So with that, we open it up to questions. Um, here's my contact info, my website, Instagram, Facebook group for parents and coaches. Uh, and in my email here, feel free to contact if you have something you want to ask separately. But at this point, I'll let Kim moderate our questions. Thanks, Christina. I found it really, really helpful, and I hope um, all of the participants did. I know we're a little bit over time, um, but I do want to mention that if you found this useful, this webinar is going to be available on our website. So if you navigate to the education page, scroll down towards the bottom where you see a link to webinars, click there, and you should be able to find this um, this posted hopefully within a day or two on the webinars page. So um, just wanted to make sure that everybody knows that that's out there. Um, so there were a couple questions about working with um, sports psych. I think you answered those within your presentation, um, but very important um, to involve sports psychologists or mental health professionals um, very often when there is an eating issue. And I think you would agree. Yeah, oh, 100%. It is, it's, it's a mental battle as much as it is a physical battle. And, and like I shared with my own story, I mean, really the hard work and the change and the healing and recovery came from, from therapy. Um, so yes, don't, don't think that just because it's a nutrition issue, um, it can be fixed. It's very much a mental battle that needs a lot of support. Mm -hmm. Uh, another question came in that says, um, asking about gymnasts who are over 16 who haven't started uh, their period. And um, I think this is definitely something that we do see in gymnastics. And I know from the medical point of view, I, I'll speak a little bit to it. Um, sometimes there are medical conditions that, that cause an athlete to not have their period. Um, but I'll let you speak to the nutrition side. Sure. Yeah. So, so typically if they've not started their menses by 16, that's called primary amenorrhea and certainly warrants uh, a full medical evaluation. Um, obviously for the gymnast, the most common cause is, is red S. So it's, it's inadequate energy intake. Um, and so the body, you know, reproductive is, it's almost this accessory function where, you know, the body gets into kind of famine shutdown mode where it says, Hey, there's not enough energy available to support a baby. So the brain's going to tell the ovaries to shut it off um, until there's enough energy there. And so that's the most common issue, which obviously can be remedied with appropriate refueling and potentially adjustments <laughs> to training. Uh, but there could be other issues like hormonal conditions like polycystic ovarian syndrome, uh, which has a, a different treatment modality to it. Unfortunately, either of those conditions can be intertwined in disordered eating, um, stress, you know, psychological stress can certainly affect um, the, the hypothalamus, you know, gonadal axis. And so certainly don't accept that just because your gymnast hasn't started the period by 16, that it's normal. And also don't accept that, you know, just putting them on birth control to, you know, jumpstart their period or to get them to bleed to protect their bones. Like that's really just band-aiding um, the underlying issue, which again, for the gymnast is typically just inadequate nutrition. 
Thanks. Uh, there, there's another comment here, which um, I, I want to just echo positive mental training and emotional support, very important um, for coaches and parents, both be proactive in building self-esteem and confidence. Um, you spoke a little bit to that. Um, and, you know, although this webinar is focused a lot on nutrition, I think what, what's really helpful to gymnasts is to give, make those comments that are positive and supportive. And that's what's going to get your athletes um, through and moving on and improve their performance um, rather than negative comments toward weight or body changes. I, I don't know if you wanted to speak a little bit more to that. Yeah, no, I mean, you covered it. it you're going to catch a lot more flies with honey you know, than anything else. And they, they just need your support and your, their encouragement. You know, the teenage years are so tumultuous for a variety of reasons. And there's honestly probably a lot more outside of gymnastics that is causing them stress and angst and, and struggles with food in their body. So, you know, they need their coaches, they need their parents to be these safe and supportive places where they can come to the gym and enjoy gymnastics because they've loved it. Uh, they can come home and they're accepted by their parents, regardless of how well they performed or regardless of what they look like. Um, that's, that's so important in just helping develop these, these young males and females into healthy functioning adults. Yeah, I agree. Um, all right, since, uh, since we're pretty far over time, I think we will uh, call it a day, but I really want to thank you, Christina. I found this extremely useful. I'm sure that our participants did as well, um, and I appreciate you taking the time to, to do this webinar for us, so thank you. Oh, absolutely. It was my pleasure, and you know, hopefully we'll, we'll do it again. Yeah, I hope so. Thanks. <laughs> Have a great day, everybody. Bye.